Gravier, who is a senior director at Wipro. Um, he'll be moderating a panel this morning um, that is going to be talking about some of the non-financial uh, industry uses of blockchain technology. Sure. All right. So, hello, everybody. Um, and, and by non-financial, every time somebody is talking blockchain nowadays, they seem to be talking crypto. And by crypto, I don't mean cryptography, which was normally be what people mean by crypto, at least a few years ago. Normal people mean it by crypto. That's, yeah, that's what normal people mean by crypto. It's cryptography. Uh, thing is, today, everybody uses crypto for cryptocurrencies and then crypto mining and then all the things we're not going to talk about today, right? So let's get this over. <coughs> Cryptocurrencies, ICOs, trading, uh, cross-border payments, remittances. I've said it. That's it for today. We're going to be talking about a whole lot of different things. So I've asked um, four, um, four panelists to come here with me and discuss their experience in working on projects that are not strictly related to payment using the blockchain, right? Um, if you're aware of how a blockchain works, uh, you, can, you can use that as a database that allows a group of people, entities, that don't necessarily trust each other to work in a trusted manner between each other nevertheless. And that trusted manner allows all kinds of interesting applications way beyond the pure financial world. That's what we're going to talk about today. So let me I'm going to be doing a little bit of reading here. Um, so um, in no specific order, but the one that I wrote the stuff in, the first one will be uh, Shankar Satish, and he leads, uh, where is Shankar? Please come up to the stage. Shankar leads the AI and data science efforts at Manulife's research lab in quantitative investment management and insurance. Insurance is interesting. Um, uh, we're not going to be talking too much about investment, right? Um, before this, he was a computer scientist at, in academia and at startups where he built AI and machine learning systems for the autonomous robotics and manufacturing industries. So um, I'm counting on him to share some experiences in, uh, in particular in the use of AI and things like that uh, and possibly how it links to, to blockchain. The second speaker uh, panelist will be Vinay Mohan and he is a, a management consultant by trade and currently leads consensus in Singapore and in, in the wider APAC region. He specializes in delivering enterprise-grade strategy and operations and has worked for global clients in a number of locations and industries. Um, I'm hoping a lot of those are not finance industries. <laughs> um, and he's a keen admirer of all things decentralized and working to enhance the blockchain ecosystem and economy in Singapore. So, welcome. Uh, next one is Calvin Chang, and uh, he's a full stack software engineer with a current interest in data science and distributed ledger technology. He helps SG Innovate, a government backed venture capital fund, with talent hunting using data and software. In his own time, to design and build all kinds of mobile and web apps for fun and profit. Their current work involves, uh, revolves around DLTs. Uh, anybody want to know DLT or not comfortable with the term DLT? We're not talking just blockchain here, right? you know, hash graphs and things like that. Um, so they, his work uh, revolves around DLTs like Hyperledger, Indy, Fabric, Corda, Hashgraph. <coughs> and I have a microphone, ooh my. Okay, um, yeah, but that's one of the four ones of my panelists. So I still have an issue. One more. Uh, if we can have one more. We, need we only have four. Yeah. We will do time sharing with the microphone. Yeah. If we can only have four, we'll handle, right? We'll do load balancing. Okay, the last one is uh, Jonas um, from Daimler. So he holds a diploma in computer science and Japanese studies from the University of Bonn. Um, his main focus topics are uh, metadata and data quality as well as neural networks. Within Daimler, where he currently works, he previously was in, the, in lead architecture roles for finance systems and various leadership positions. He's taken a keen interest in new technologies and the open source movement. In his current role, he's shaping the blockchain and DLT activities from the technology perspective with Daimler. As a member of the governing board of the Hyperledger, he's also representing that role internationally. Okay, so, so thank you very much. Um, so what I want to do, we're, we're not a huge 
we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. Let me first distribute microphones. Um, Jonas probably will share a microphone because I'm sitting yeah. next to you, that's if that's okay. All right, so I, I have a few questions that I wanted to ask the panelists, but more importantly, if you guys have questions, just raise your hand and, uh, and shout the question. We'll repeat it for recording purposes and, uh, and we'll, we'll tackle that first. But the first one I have um, is, is blockchain, has, become, has blockchain become a buzzword? Do, are people doing blockchain because, you know, because it's blockchain? Um, I, I, if I look at the companies that I work with, roughly 80%, they're doing blockchain because everybody else is, and, and they don't really know what it's gonna bring them. Um, so that's kind of the buzzword hype thing. I have about 10% of the people who are doing blockchain that have a, a reasonable idea of why they're doing it, and they're doing it because they're already doing some existing process but they want to optimize it. They want to make it faster, cheaper, more secure, uh, disintermediated. And that's how the, 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 the computer industry has been working for the last 50 years, right? Every time there's been a new revolution when we went to, from data center, well, mainframe to client server, all the system integrators had a field day moving everybody to, to uh, um, uh, client server. Then when we went to, from client server to distributed, we did that. Uh, we, we, went, we had also the workstation Phase. Remember workstations, right? They're dead now. Um, then we grid. We and the next revolution is IoT. Okay, but right now we're at the blockchain space, uh, which is going to power the IoT world. So that's those ten percent. And there's a last group of ten percent who are doing blockchain to change the way the world is going. And these people are really exploring blockchain to create new ways of doing business. New business models, new applications that are not possible uh, without a blockchain, right? And these people, sometimes they're doing this project on a blockchain just because they know that they'll get funding for it because of the, word, the buzzword aspect. But I'd like to ask my panelists if they see that as well and, and how they feel that. So I'll start with Jonas and give him the mic. Um, so the short answer would be yes. <laughs> technology and you can do stuff with it and I don't know how far it can go but we can do something and people would say ah nobody needs that yeah and then it's a buzzword and then everybody uh, comes to you and if you have a little bit of knowledge in it and says we have to do something with blockchain and it's like okay what do you want to do uh, we don't know but it has to be with blockchain and um, then there are these cases where you, where you in, engage in a discussion and they have even an idea, you know, I want to have one central database where I can store uh, people, that's not the right case. Yeah. Then there are also the cases where you think, yeah, that's definitely a, a use case for blockchain. And then there are those cases where I first, first thought and even thought that topic and thought, oh, this is so stupid, yeah, you cannot do it. And then, after a few discussions and a few days later, I thought, wait a second, there's a thing to it, and I learned something, and maybe you can also apply that topic to this. So it's a very interesting time at the moment, and it's a buzzword, yes, you can do a lot with it, yes. Will it save the world? Maybe in some parts. Will it change the world? Probably. Uh, but will it change all processes? No. Talent? <coughs> Justify their the way. 
way that they are approaching their marketplace token through different um, utility rationales. Uh, but at the end of it all, the bottom line is, why don't you just accept Fiat? You know, why do you need Fiat to be converted to a token in order for it to be used in your marketplace? And um, there will be lots of complicated uh, answers given to that uh, question. <laughs> it's always interesting to have uh, lunch with friends and just talk casually. And um, the conclusion is always, hey, um, actually, it is an interesting use case to use token in our marketplace, and we see it as a way to raise uh, cheap or free funding. Um, and we are not out there for cash back, unlike the rest of the people out there. <laughs> it's but after it. enough lunches, I'm wondering um, who are the ones that are going for the cash back, because everybody says they are not going for the cash back. So, yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, is blockchain and the way around it a buzzword? Is it a buzz? It, it most certainly is. Uh, the, the key difference is, I think, um, we as a as a species are probably more justified, and it is far more understandable uh, to have buzz around the <coughs> concept of paradigm than a lot of others before its time, for a couple of reasons. First of all, look at how mainstream blockchain today is evolving, right? And even though PLP is in distributed computing and parallel processing has been an evolution, a linear model for the last 20 years or so, um, Bitcoin, which really kicked off this whole buzz for mainstream blockchain adoption, came from a pseudonymous party known as Satoshi Nakamoto, he, she, they, or it, whatever, um, uh, whoever that was. Um, and it, it, it seeks to sort of solve a, a very foundational social construct or social problem. <coughs> As opposed to machine learning or AI or other paradigms which are more linear, uh, I would say blockchain is more foundational. So the buzz that you see today is, is extremely palpable and I think it's quite understandable because it touches so many facets <coughs> of, of civilization. It's not just about financial services, it's not about everything in marketplaces. It is about solving the problem of trust. It is a 7,000 year old problem in the history of human civilization, which is about to be addressed. So I would say that it is probably understandable partially justified in my view. Um, and there's always going to be FOMO, right? You always have this fear of missing out. Be it blockchain, be it robotics, be it new ways of investment and, and, and alternative security, whatever it is. Uh, human greed is always going to power this. We are always constantly going to look out for the next best incentive. Uh, but with blockchain, I think there's a there's a uh, far more far ranging implication with this sort of buzz. Cool. Are the world's largest. 
just the primary of cryptography. Like we had cryptography, which we mostly, uh, let's say, did research that, then limited deployment in the real world to things like sophisticated authorities and so on, but that's kind of really the, the extent to which we sort of deployed actual cryptography. But blockchains are now our chance to have massive deployment of cryptography. Uh, and, and as a result of that, uh, a lot of the mind share and sort of conversation is now moving towards cryptography and security. And you know, security is one of those areas of computer science which has always been, uh, you know, you work in security, it's kind of a thankless job where if you do your job well, nobody notices you and you're going under the line like if you screw up. Uh, and now because people are buying cryptocurrencies and storing them, uh, there is now such a degree of public sort of awakening of how important security is. And you know, losing money is the fastest way to earn. <coughs> So, um, for me, one of the signs that slowly out of the buzz phase is when people stop using that name to justify or sell a project. And um, to, just to give you an example, because that, that's kind of my segue into looking at non-financial applications for blockchain, there's another buzzword in, at this time, which is really strong in Europe, by the way, it's called GDPR. Uh, which is the, uh, the general data protection regulations for, for all, con all entities doing business or having presence in Europe. So it impacts the whole planet that's trying to deal with Europe. And so everybody's doing GDPR now. And, um, and I have a customer that, that came to me that said, we, we want to, to build a GDPR solution. Okay, that's fine. Uh, and uh, we want to do it with a blockchain. So, you know, I, I take a step back and I say, so, okay, a blockchain is interesting because we can we can use it to to track all of the transactions which will be events happening on on the, the private data so for example when an, an employee has I don't know their passport number that changes uh, they have to be able to modify that uh, wherever it's being used because there's a right to modifying your data part of the GDPR so when you when you want to modify your that data, you make a, make a request to the privacy officer, to the data officer, to the HR person, whoever is your contact, and that request should be logged and then tracked. So you should know when that request has been sent to whoever needs to process it, when to, when it's been processed, and then you should be told you know that. And if somebody needs to audit it from the outside, they should be able to look at all those transactions and check that they've happened in the right kind of time frame. And and that's a very nice use case for a blockchain. But honestly, you know, it's, it's an event tracking system. People have been using event tracking systems since we have events to track, so decades. And we've been doing that with databases. Actually, two years ago, I built an event tracking system for a bank in Switzerland, and they were using Cassandra to, to do the event tracking uh, between entities, right? So, so I look at them and say, yeah, you, I mean, you can do this with a blockchain. A blockchain is a nice and elegant way to do it but you don't have to use a blockchain for that. So why do you want a blockchain? And they look at me and say, well, because our company's uh, investors want the company to look at the, the tip of modernity and we will get funding if we do a blockchain project. Okay, so we'll do blockchain, right? But that's because it's still in the buzzword phase, right? You wouldn't hear this if somebody came and talked to you about doing a Java project 20 years ago. People would do a Java project because it was the buzzword of the day, and another 20 years ago it was AI, and oh, wait, it still is now. <laughs> People are still, it's again. <laughs> it's again, right? But, but we have these phases. So what I'd like to explore now, using that example of a GDPR solution, is uh, what kind of uh, uses of blockchain have you seen out there that are not related to ICOs and, 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 and getting money or transacting money, but more uh, on using the blockchain as a as a uh, an infrastructure for uh, for doing trusted interactions between yeah a lot fortunately examples I am an, 
a very big company, and this big company has a lot of use cases. I can give you, not all of them I can give you, yeah, but uh, one I can, can maybe explain is, um, it's a thing of uh, trust again. Yeah? So um, in the world where maybe I sell you something, <laughs> yeah, and uh, you, I sell you something, I give you the invoice for it, yeah, and you should pay me by means of uh, going to the bank and tell me, okay, this bank, th this bank account number, and eventually uh, I don't get the money. Yeah. Why is this happening? Because somebody uh, is actually getting this kind of invoices and falsifying or counterfeiting the the bank account number. Yeah. So uh, <coughs> this is fraud. And um, uh, since a lot of the invoicing nowadays is still very, very manual, yeah, or it's automated with AI, but the AI is more or less just reading the number and just giving you the money then, or just uh, doing a, a transaction. Uh, and the question we, we had is, um, how can we, what can we do about it? Yeah? So think about an open ledger yeah, that has like my name, uh, I sign it with my personal you know, crypto key. Uh, I sign. I say my name. This is my bank account number. Maybe on a comp company scale. Yeah, and it's open. It's not only one has the truth, but it's distributed, and everybody shares a, uh, you know, the same view on it because you want to have it distributed. You want your bank account number uh, rightfully recorded, and then if you are going to be to give me the money, yeah or other way around, uh, then before you look at this at this open ledger and see, okay, this is his bank account number and I don't look actually at the invoice, I just use this one. Yeah? And uh, this could be an application. I think it has something to do with trust uh, and it has something to do with like public information that should be anyhow somehow recorded. Uh, it's kind of linked in of account numbers, uh, bank account numbers that is also trusted. Yeah, something like this could be done with blockchain. It has nothing to do uh, with a token. So in relation to what Jonas has said, uh, I think one of the most interesting projects out there right now uh, is called Hyperledger AV. Um, for those of you familiar with Hyperledger, it's not just uh, IBM's Hyperledger fabric. No offense to IBM, <laughs> but there are many variants of Hyperledger. Hyperledger AV is actually a identity Foundation called Sovereign, uh, which is an international organization that runs this note. Right? Um, Hyperledger Indie is, in, you can think of Hyperledger Indie as an, uh, sorry, you can think of Sovereign as an implementation of Hyperledger Indie. And what it does is that it allows multiple organizations to run their own notes and validate um, identities of individuals without needing individuals to store their identity on a central database or even on the ledger itself. So it does that by using a zero knowledge proof cryptography. And so that actually changes the entire way identity is being done on the internet right now. So to me, it's a very promising and a very interesting take on login. Right? <coughs> All of you should be very familiar with what's happening now with uh, Facebook and uh, Cambridge Analytica. So the world of decentralized ledgers and the world of centralized authorities like Facebook, like Google, which we all depend heavily on for our uh, digital identity, is on opposite spectrum, right? And um, the human race is very interesting because we live through cycles and the pendulum now is swinging towards uh, the other end, right? There's no right or wrong. Uh, I'm not here to pass any it is what it is. Right? There's, there's, there, are, there are episodes in human history where centralized power is cool and important. And right now, the pendulum seems to be swinging a little bit back towards the decentralized world uh, across the political spectrum. So I, I'm not here to judge whether communis uh, communism is good or dem democracy is good. <laughs> I, I'm just here to illustrate that, hey, there's a, a lot of interesting projects on DLTs or use. Implementing decentralized identities with a 
W3C um, and DOC new way of identifying individuals using PID. Right? Uh, if you, are, you have been doing centralized database, you'll be very familiar with UUID. So DID is the uh, direct opposite of a UUID. You get a unique ID, but it is essentially collision resistant as well. And it is global. It doesn't rely on the fact that you have a central database to issue you that unique uh, ID. So that coupled with uh, zero knowledge proof cryptography is going to change the way that people are able to identify themselves online. It's going to change how AML and KYC is done so that you can safely um, send money across the world uh, without revealing unnecessary information. Uh, you, you, you then are truly in control of your own information. But that said, it is a complicated ma matter to manage your own information, right? Which is why people become lazy and, well, <laughs> that is human nature, right? And rely on third party services to manage your information for, for you. So whether the, 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 um, the population can actually learn to manage their own information safely, that's a different topic. Just because it's decentralized um, doesn't mean that you won't do stupid things like in your private key when someone asks you for it. <laughs> and therefore, yeah, but the project is very promising, and I'm uh, just a little bit of pitch here. I'm giving a talk about it in more detail tomorrow if you're interested. Zero knowledge proof for identity is interesting from a Zero knowledge proof for identity is also interesting from a GDPR perspective because you're never giving out Absolutely. private data, you're Absolutely. but you are proving your identity. <laughs> then uh, there's still a thing to it, and then you still have the law in uh, in, in Europe with the right to be forgotten. And if the implementation was just bad, so we have to be very very sure about yep. that kind of implementation. I mean, we had this even with hard hardware cryptography, where uh, the implementation I don't know from which company it was was so bad that nowadays RSA in, 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 uh, in Estonia they had to like spread right. all of right. the systems there. Yeah? Yeah. So if you look at blockchains, take a step back and look at the features of what a good blockchain might look like. And for me, a good blockchain for all intents and purposes is Ethereum. Um, even though consensus is a protocol agnostic company, I would reference Ethereum. Um, we have moved from a network economy, or we are moving from a network economy, which the internet facilitated, to what is now called a shared economy, which blockchains are going to facilitate. And three you need immutable truth. Yeah, there's only one version of that truth, so it's got to be completely immutable. It has to be true for all of us. Um, you don't need, or you cannot rather have central intermediaries. It's a P2P network, it's peer to peer. We don't want to go back to the 7,000 year old system of having a central agent to dominate and control and power play and use arbitrage, and that sort of thing. Um, and most importantly, you need a way to bring adversarial stakeholders together. Sharing works when we can find a basis to agree with one another. And that's the key thing that blockchain is trying to solve for. That's the beauty of this whole paradigm. Um, so those three features considered, think of uh, you know, use cases such as provenance tracking, uh, tracking <coughs> real world assets that run, acro run across global supply chains that are highly temporal, which means they pass through different stages of time. And exchange hands, um, hands that don't necessarily agree with one another. Shippers, buyers, sellers, suppliers, intermediaries, processors, you know, all of these agents that drive modern commerce, you know, trillions of dollars happening every day, um, these agents don't agree with one another. And we have banks, for example, you know, uh, to, to be the intermediary to facilitate. So provenance tracking is, is a very interesting use case on blockchain. And, and consensus has about <coughs> three dozen odd projects concurrently any any point in time. One of our one is a product called Bind. Um, you can look it up. It's a, a provenance tracking solution. Um, and there are many others in the market as well. And basically what provenance tracking solutions do is they enable a common truth in which all of the different parties, regardless of what they do or, or where they stand in the supply chain, 
can reference a common database. So you have a single golden source of truth. Nobody can dispute anything else because in a, in a, in a conventional world where your database and my database are two separate siloed you know, environments, you and I can collude or you and I can choose to dispute and that leads to the problem of inefficiency. It leads to reconciliation issues, it leads to delays. But with a blockchain, with the atomic settlement aspect, which is either a yes or a no right now, not T plus one or T plus two, um, this dispute mechanism is almost negative. It's, it's, it's nearly eliminated. And the need for reconciliation is nearly eliminated. So provenance tracking is one. You know, self-sovereign identity is, is, a, is a great new application in the world of blockchain. Um, how can you identify yourself and, and, and uh, protocols like Ethereum give you the infrastructure to, to place that immutable truth and, and make sure that it's scattered across thousands of nodes all over the world, uh, making it mathematically feasible to hack. Because, you know, the, the billions of dollars sitting right now is the world's biggest honeypot. No one's hacked into it. Smart contracts are being hacked, but the blockchain itself is not. Um, so provenance tracking, um, identity systems, very interesting, uh, just one final point. Consensus just announced two days ago a project called Virtual Poker. Uh, and Virtual Poker, it has a tokenization mechanism underneath, but the interesting thing about Virtual Poker is, for the longest of time, gambling has been dominated by the house or a central agent. Imagine if you can have a truthful way of the four of us or five of us playing poker to, to verify whether it's provably, um, you know, accurate, provably correct. So, completely offbeat examples, right? But it's, it's making ripples around the world today. So think about any application that needs peer-to-peer, -peer immutable truth, and golden source of data. Uh, and, and if you look at pro uh, provenance tracking, um, it's, 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 a, it's the core of the, the supply chain transparency type of platforms. If you take supply chain transparency and add a feature to it like smart contracts, you actually get enterprise automation free. <laughs> Um, every time you track an activity on your supply chain, you can trigger a smart contract that will <coughs> trigger activities and, 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 and sequence your, your, your supply chain. Um, this can either be used to tap into ERP systems like SAP or replace some of the functionality. So that's, that's a game changer. It's another area where the disintermediation that blockchain brings is challenging uh, historical ways of doing things, right? Do I need an ERP system now? Uh, a uh, such a complex system uh, like SAP where integration with other system takes years um, and, or can I just use a blockchain uh, and, and have everybody talk on the blockchain and that'll trigger operations to, you know, for example, if I, if I order a, a batch of 1,000 phones, um, that automatically triggers the provisioning of storage in, a, in the, the next warehouse and things like that. So, so that's, a, that's a way uh, that a blockchain will change uh, the way we do business and, and, and interaction between, between companies. Consider that in light of the principle of the right to be forgotten, right? So if you uh, go and add your customer information into a blockchain, and then you receive a letter from a, from a lawyer or even from, directly from the customer asking them to erase your, all of your data from all of your systems and from all of these sort of second party systems that you're using as well, and one of those things happened to be a blockchain that you, know, you inserted this data into, you kind of shot yourself in the foot. Uh, so not only is it difficult you know, to use blockchains to sort of uh, prove that you are complying with the GDPR, it might just be impossible unless you go to some place like Accenture <laughs> and use their you know, editable blockchain. No. Right? Like, <laughs> Please, no. <laughs> it is, uh, it's something to bear in mind. And what the GDPR is doing is, is bringing to the forefront uh, what a lot of people who have been sort of deeply embedded into the computational advertising and you know, ad tech industry sort of know in their heart, which is that data is uh, like a toxic <coughs> right? So once data gets out, uh, your possession, 
it's good to impossible to control who's going to do what with it and who's going to come with it there and if it's going to get sold or what's going to happen. <coughs> so, uh, you know, and, and then the GDPR, uh, quite interestingly, you know, written by a, a group of non-technical people, but sort of thought through uh, with a, like a philosophy and with the tradition of philosophy that's, uh, that a lot of lawyers have. Uh, it, it, when you when you read it, and, and then you you start to realize that you know as a business, maybe now you have to start thinking about not just becoming a data driven or a data scientific business, but also consider the fact that even if you succeed in your sort of data science endeavor, the fact that you are amassing all of this sensitive data might just be a toxic liability. So the question really is, how do you still sort of provide services? and do computation uh, while avoiding this liability. And let me just sort of hint and uh, stay back after the panelists want to hear more details, but you can do things like uh, secure multi-party computation, which is essentially a sub-branch of cryptography where what you can do is you can compute functions on data that is split across multiple parties with that data never leaving said party and each party having no clue about the existence of other parties. So, you know, there are sort of solutions in cryptography that are kind of cutting, and it, does, it requires a lot of thought, but a naive implementation all of your customer data and put it in a blockchain and then you get audited, uh, will probably fail if you end up in the courtroom. So that sounds like an intersection of spoiler alert, open mind. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and keep in mind that a blockchain, while it is a database, it's not a general purpose database in which you store everything, right? It's more a database for storing transactions. So these transactions can point to data that's stored elsewhere. And when you need to delete the data, you would delete the data itself and you would put a transaction in the blockchain. That data is not there anymore. And that resolves the GDPR issue. You have a traceability that something has happened to the data and the data has disappeared from where it was stored, so it's not accessible anymore. But it requires uh, not storing the data in the blockchain itself. Yeah, you have to be sort of, yeah, you have to sort of think of second order effects and uh, yeah, you just can't be super naive and have a naive implementation. That's, that's so, so we have three minutes for sort of closing comments. I would just like to, okay. Um, so you're talking about the immutable blockchain, um, but Ethereum has forked the blockchain in 2016. I don't know, I mean like, terms of integrity, what's the deal here? You talk about, oh, you cannot change the blockchain, but we're gonna fork it because the price dropped 50%. I'm curious what your opinions are. So if I can't speak for the foundation, sure, because sure, I don't sure. represent um, the community that's made that happen, um, but I believe what did happen was a consensus-based early stages of the, the technology, um, and it was done with the spirit of saying, look, we, we did not invent Ethereum for somebody to walk away with $60 million. So there's two things that I think as you know, public perception tends to lean against. One is, first of all, the blockchain did not get hacked. It was a uh, poorly smart contract that stalled a, um, you know, that stalled the, 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 the correct execution of excessive transfer of money, uh, which, which allowed the thieves to walk away with the $60 million. Right? And unfortunately, Fortunately, there was a moratorium of uh, I think 30 days before which the funds could be taken out of the system and it was hard forked within 48 hours. Uh, it happened through consensus by community. Uh, I'm personally, I, I'm, not, I'm not unduly worried about that. I think it is controversial because of obvious reasons that you know, somebody says this is decentralized, but who gets to choose that you, know, you can hard fork it? But it was a community decision. It was not the back of you know, one, one individual or a group of people. It was a community-based consensus. Ethereum Classic still exists. As a as a uh, as another fork, um, you know I'm 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 not uh, I'm not going to try and defend that. Uh, I'm not I'm not going to say that um, that should have never been done. Uh, for me, this is a fragile early stage <coughs> paradigm. It will go through some sort of teething troubles. It is not going to be free of you know um, its imperfections. But the fact remains that um, we have to look at the larger picture of here. Uh, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about you know the controversy surrounding that. Okay, so I mean, I find my, my, I find it a little bit weird when you talk about immutability. Yet, is this well, where, where's the immutability when you support? Um, so, uh, 
maybe that's a little bit sloppy language when you say you know it's uh, you can't teach you know the blockchain. Right. Uh, the more sort of uh, correct language is to uh, compute the cost of change, and that's something that you can call it, that you can compute mm -hmm. uh, in terms of dollars, and compared to uh, any other technology, you know, database-based implementation, that cost is multiple orders of magnitude higher. <coughs> so it's just a colloquial way. <coughs> And there's another aspect is that because it's a distributed ledger, any change to the ledger is immediately detected by everybody. So you cannot change it in a way that it would surprise people and, and happen without their knowledge. And that's also a key element. If you take a traditional database, and unless there's an audit trail somewhere, an admin can modify a record. And, and nobody, no, nobody's the wiser. With a blockchain, that is just not possible. So, so I would... I would uh I would argue with that because um, reasonably possible knowledge. There's no such thing as a <coughs> information yeah. flow in the world. So, uh, as far as people who understand decentralized ledgers are concerned, they understand that, right? But um, that's just a small percentage of the world yeah. population. Agreed. The biggest problem here is that um, terminology has certain connotation and definition, and those terminology are interpreted in a particular context across a particular spectrum. So if you say that a uh, decentralized ledger is going to save the world and peer-to-peer, -to -peer, I, I don't truly buy that because yeah. it is a spectrum of governance. Mm. Right, where at one extreme, you have authoritarian decisions, like single dictators <coughs> and everything, um, all the way across to having a community deciding it. But even a community actually is a centralized it's not registered in any uh, company registry, but a community is it's a fluid definition of a group of people who govern something. So is it truly decentralized? You know, if you stick to the strict definition of decentralization, well, a community is not decentralized. I mean, there's also a lot of very interesting and philosophical aspects in, in terms of what is really decentralization and do we don't need any intermediaries anymore and so on, yeah? I think there will still be aggregators, and they think there will still be a lot of people that rely on services of others and don't want to run their own stuff and so on. Yeah, and also you have to think of uh, like immutability is only a function of time. For a certain time, it's immutable, so the data is stored somewhat. But think of if we would have started a blockchain with MD5 hashes, we would probably have some alternative realities right now. Yeah, uh, or. Yeah, if cost quantum cryptography does something to a SHA-2 whatever or 5 whatever, then yeah, we might also have something there. So it's only, it's a myth, like true immutability is a myth, but uh, at least for a certain period of time. Okay, um, I guess, so one thing is clear here, we could continue this discussion for another two or three hours and we'd still have new subjects to cover and new types of applications to cover. Uh, unfortunately, we're already running three minutes late. So thank you, um, first of all, to the audience for having uh, listened, participated, and to my panelists for having provided such, uh, such insight into uh, applications of blockchain. I, I want to leave you with some homework. Um, go Google something called the Cicada Project, C-I-C-A, DA, you, it's people who are trying to build a government infrastructure on a blockchain. Think, can I trust my government? Can all the decisions made my, by, govern, by my government be monitored openly on a blockchain with all the citizens participating? That's another application. Have a look at it. It's really interesting. And I'm not involved in the project at all. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.